He won't. And so we raise a hallelujah. Raise a hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Great job, worship team, as usual. I'm kind of like, uh, kind of like Emily this morning. If that didn't light your fire, your wood's wet, right? Good worship this morning. Appreciate everybody coming and uh, being a part of it and entering in. Uh, welcome this morning if you're a visitor. Uh, when church is over, by the way, Crossway people, look around. If you see a face you've never seen before, uh, show them some love and welcome them. We want you to know that we're glad you're here and I uh, want you to feel the presence of God uh, above all things. So it's a privilege for me to stand up here and share the Word of God with you. Did you all enjoy the VBS program last week? I thought that was, that was really good. A lot of comments back on that. That was good. Appreciate Henry and Sue and all the work they did there, and that was it was a great program, and uh, that's what we're all about, amen, is uh, seeing Jesus um, introduced to kids, uh, teenagers, middle-aged people, and old people, amen? Whatever part of the spectrum you're on, we want you to know that Jesus loves you, and so do we, amen? So we're going to jump into the Word this morning. If you want to turn with me into Romans chapter number 4, I'm going to read the first four, four verses before we go to the Lord in prayer. Romans 4. One through four. Paul writing to the Roman church says, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And so before I pray, I want to kind of announce, I guess the, the title of my message this morning is, When a Gift is Not a Gift. Let's pray. Father, we come humbly before you this morning, so thankful for the gift of salvation. For that work that you did at the cross of Calvary, Lord, that we might be redeemed, that we might have the peace of God that passes all understanding, that we might have the hope that lies within us, Lord, of, of future um, uh, eternal life. God, I just pray this morning for your anointing as the minister of your gospel today, God, that I step aside and that you might, through me, just speak a word into the hearts of every person today. We pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. 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 So when is a gift not a gift? And the answer to that question is when you have to work for it. Amen. That's basically what Paul is saying at the last part of this verse. To the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as what's due him, basically. So works to repay a gift is not a gift. That's a paycheck. At the end of the week, when your boss comes in with your paycheck and hands it to you, he or she doesn't say, I just really, I, wanna, I just want you to know, I want to give this to you. Here's a gift. That's not a gift. That's a paycheck. You earned that, right? Uh, on Christmas morning, if you gather your kids around the Christmas tree and you hand your kid a gift and you say, here's a gift, I'll give this to you if you clean your room later. It's no longer a gift. It is an allowance for a chore, right? It's not a gift. They have to do something to get it. That's not a gift. If you go to give somebody something, have you ever had this happen? You just, maybe you have two of something, guys, maybe you got two of a certain tool or a gun or something. Ladies, you got like two boonie and dirky purses or something that you're wanting to uh, give another lady. And have you ever went to give something to somebody? And what is, nine times out of ten, what do they usually say? Oh, well, I'll pay you for it, right? It's, it's, sometimes it's hard to just receive a gift. You feel like you need to give something in return. And that, you know, it kind of takes you back. And, no, no, I don't, want, I don't want any money because if you, if you give me money, then it's just a purchase, right? There has to be, for a gift, it, something to be a gift, you can't be anything done to purchase it or to earn it. A gift is given with no strings attached and no payment expected. And that's the way salvation works through Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul is saying in this. Not works are wages. And he's using Abraham as an example there. You know, and throughout Scripture, there's several different times that Paul uses Abraham as an example that the reason why God looked at Abraham and said, that guy is righteous, was for one reason. It was the fact that he just believed God. It was his faith in God that God said, Abraham is a righteous man. Now, after the fact, Abraham went and he offered his son. He was willing to offer his son as a sacrifice. But what the scripture tells us is that was a response to the faith that he already had. Does that make sense? It was faith that made Abraham accepted in God's eyes, not his works. And so it is with us. Now, I want to, talk about, I want to, I want to try to make this very clear this morning that we, we don't, we're not saved by any works that we do. A gift is free and clear. However, 
after a gift has been received, it's, it's normal to respond with acts of, rep- of appreciation. Not repayment, but acts of, of, of appreciation and gratitude. So let me give you an example of this. And this is actually kind of where I got the, the thought. The Lord first put this thought in my, my heart for this message today. If you remember last week at the end of the VBS uh, program, we had the sliming. You may not remember that. I remember it well. It t- I, I've, I'm still picking that stuff out of my hair. But the idea was, if you weren't here, that all week long, there were four teams, and they were earning points in different ways. All four of those teams had a team leader. So the team leader that lost was to get slimed by the team leader who won. The team leader who won was Kelsey, and the team leader who lost was Rachel Martin, right? And so everybody thought it was going to be Allie, but Allie pulled through at the very end, and, and it was Rachel. So we put the pool out here. Rachel sits in the seat. She, now, let me, let me make something very clear. She deserved to get slimed. Right? And she'll be the first to admit that. Her team lost. So she deserved to get slimed. But if you remember, I said, Rachel, would you like me, and me and Henry, well, I say me and Henry, Henry has idea. We cooked this all up ahead of time. So I say to Rachel, as she's ready to get slimed, that she deserves, would you like for me to take your place? And she's like, uh, yeah. And so I did. She got out of the pool, out from underneath the slime. I got in, and I got slimed. And we're still picking it out of the, uh, the cracks of the uh, hardwood floor up here. So I got slimed. We all saw that, and you get the point, that Jesus took our place, that we deserve punishment for our sins, we deserve hell, but Jesus, when he went to the cross, that's literally what he was doing is, Dennis, I will take your place. He took my punishment. Now, you saw that part, but what the part you didn't see was that when church was all over and everybody was leaving, I was up here with a mop, and I was cleaning up, or attempting to clean up, uh, the slime with a mop. What you didn't see was Rachel came up to me and she, she grabbed hold of the mop and she said, I'll tell you what, you took my place, now let me take your place. She was willing to clean up the mess. So she, this, wasn't, this wasn't necessarily in repayment. I didn't say to her, now Rachel, I'll take your place if you'll clean the mess up later. Because it's not a gift, right? That wasn't the idea. She didn't come up to me as a, okay, well now I'm kind of obligated. No, it was, a, it was an act of appreciation from her heart. You took my sliming. Now the least I can do is something for you, right? That's the idea. You see the difference in the, the heart mentality. I thought that was really, really cool. That was the proper response for the gift, an act of gratitude for what I had already done for her. And that's the way kind of it is when we get saved, we don't do anything to, to earn our salvation, but when we've been saved, truly saved and changed by the blood of Jesus Christ, there's something in us that then wants to do something for God, right? Not because we have to do it to, to, to repay him, it's just out of the work that he's already done for us, it's gratitude in our heart that then wants to step up and do what we know that will bless God's heart. Amen? It's the difference. It's the have to versus the want to. She didn't have to offer that to me. I, I, I took her sliming. Whether she, it, she could have walked up to me at the grocery store this week and ignored me. I still took her place. Right? I still did it. No matter, no matter how she responded, I did it. But it was out of that gratitude. She didn't have to come up and say, I'll clean the mess. She wanted to out of gratitude. That's when the work um, is, is true. So in Ephesians chapter 2, if you want to turn there with me, um, of course, it's kind of the go-to scripture for this particular topic because it explains it so well as, as Paul is, you know, all, the majority of these scriptures that we read from today are uh, the writings of the Apostle Paul that he wrote to different churches that he started or to different people. And what we find very clear throughout all the writings of Paul, who wrote the, who wrote the majority of the New Testament, the, the, the theme that we see overall, it, ultimately what Paul is trying to get across to everybody is this, you can't do anything anything to earn salvation, right? That, that's his message. That's the message of the gospel. So in Ephesians chapter 2, as he's writing to the church in Ephesus, he says this in verse 1, and you uh, were dead in trespasses and sins as before they came to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, 
like the rest of mankind. In other words, you know, before you come to know Jesus, you were sinners, just like all of us are and have been. Um, but God, aren't you thankful for God? Amen. I love that. Those two words are powerful. You used to be lost in your sin by nature the children of wrath, abiding under the wrath of God, but God. That changed everything. But God being rich in mercy. Because of the great love with, with which he has loved us, every one of us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up and seated us in, with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. And what I read out of that is that obviously we, we receive an enormous amount of God's grace when we get saved. But then he just keeps pouring on the grace every day after that. What is grace? What is mercy? Ultimately it's this. When you deserve punishment but you get forgiveness instead. That's grace. And God gives us to that, gives that to us when we're saved. And then every day we live under an immeasurable, I love that, an immeasurable num amount of faith. If, if God's faith was an ocean, it would have no depth. There is no way ever to exhaust or completely run out of God's grace. It is always available to us. That is God's gift to us through Jesus. So then uh, verse number eight. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that is not of your own doing, not of yourselves, the King James says. In, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Okay? So it's a gift, not of works. What is it if you work for something? That's a paycheck. That's wages. Salvation is a gift. He said, it's not of works lest you boast. In other words, think about it. If, if we were saved, if we could only get to heaven by what we do, works that we do, we would brag about that. Right? Well, I'm saved because I, you know, gave half of my income to feed the poor. Or I'm saved because I, you know, built the church. I'm saved because I did this. And we'd be bragging. We'd put ourselves in that. And what grace does is it puts everybody on a level playing field. Amen? Nobody is saved by our works because otherwise we would boast. So when we're saved by grace, God's grace, his love, and his forgiveness, then we do our boasting on God. Amen? We're not bragging on ourselves, we're bragging on God in that he would give us such a wonderful gift. For we, verse 10, are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We have been saved, not because of works, but for works. Does that make sense? Got to get the cart after the horse, right? Horse comes first, then the cart. Salvation and faith comes first, then the works. We've got to make sure we have that in the right order. There's a big difference in works for salvation and works because of salvation. Now in Titus chapter 2, and some of these I'm, gonna, I'm not going to wait for you to get there. Uh, I'm gonna, I've got them jotted down here. I'm going to read them. But if, I would encourage you to jot these down and maybe study these um, throughout the week. Um, two things a sermon like this should hopefully do and scriptures like this should hopefully do is number one, make you appreciate the gift of salvation more. Amen? And realize, man, I didn't deserve this. I did not deserve God's love and he gave it to me. And it should make us appreciate the salvation that we have. But number two, it should spark us into wanting to do something for God. Amen? Out of appreciation and gratitude. Titus 2, 11 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works." People who are zealous, for what does zealous mean? It means enthusiastic, passionate, right? Jesus gave some parables, you know, about his coming. How many believe, still believe Jesus Christ is coming back? Amen. And of course, and that's what Paul is talking about here. And Jesus gave some parables talking about basically when Jesus returns, he's looking for the people who's been working for him, amen? People who have received salvation as a free gift and then have just put that, that gift to work uh, in their everyday life. And so he says, we have been created, we have been saved for those works. Even before the foundation of the world, when God planned out salvation, this was his idea that he would ultimately spread the gospel through people. That requires us to do something with what God has given us. 
Kind of like she, you know, she had somebody give her those, that bag of nerds, which I thought was pretty fitting. No, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> gave her that bag of nerds, but what was, she received this gift, and what did she say she would do with it? I'll share it. I've been given a gift, and I'm glad to share it. That's the heart that God is looking for. Take it from a nerd, right? God has given this nerd salvation that deserved punishment in hell, and then enabled me to stand up here and share with you that same gift that God has given to me. So he says, I'm looking for people, uh, his own possession, who are zealous, enthusiastic, passionate for good works. He goes on to say in chapter 3 of Titus, this, this saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are as excellent and profitable for people right? That we're zealous, that we devote ourselves to work, working for God after salvation. We've received the same gift because that is profitable for people. The only way people can find out about Jesus is if we're willing to share this great gift that God has given us. Here's the thing to remember. God loves people, okay? God loves people. If you, if you want to give somebody a gift, maybe your, your wife or your husband, you want to give them something that shows your love for them. Typically, you're going to give them something that they like, right? I mean, if my wife was to give me a gift, and her, she said, I love you so much, and I want to show my appreciation, and she brought me a bag of onions. <laughs> That's not, I hate onions. Why would she give me something that I hate? She's going to find something that I like. She'll bring me a bag of Reese's peanut butter cups. or so She knows I like it, and then she gives it to me. That's what makes the gift special. And so when we think about receiving this gift from God, this gift of salvation, and then our works afterwards are, are, are kind of more about us giving a gift to God. Because that's what you do with people that you love. Right? Her birthday's in May, and I give her a gift because I love her. My birthday is one month later. She doesn't give me a gift because she's like, well, he got me something. Now I guess I better give him something. No, she gives me, she gives me a gift because she loves me. And so when God saved me, he gave me this gift, and now I want to do what God wants me to do and, and work for him. I, don't want to, I shouldn't do it from the attitude of, well, I guess God saved me. I better do this. No, it's about our works are about giving God a gift. Amen. We're, as humans, we're all about getting the gifts, but our works are about giving God a gift. And so if you're going to give a gift to somebody, you give them something that you know they like. God likes people. God loves people. He's not willing that anybody perish, but that everybody come to repentance. So how do we give God a gift? We give him what he likes. He likes people. We minister to people through our works. That's what it's about whether it's preaching or giving or you name it, helping, helping people, our gifts are profitable for people. They help people, which is then a gift to God because he loves people. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul writes to the church of Philippi, he says this, Therefore God has highly exalted him, Jesus, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue Confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father, God the Father. Therefore, anytime you see the word therefore, when you're reading something, therefore means whatever you're about to read is referring back to what you just got done reading. Does that make sense? So we just got done declaring that God's been given Jesus a name above every name and that every single knee will bow. In other words, every human who has ever lived ever, from Adam and Eve to the very last person who exists when Jesus comes. Every person who has ever lived will at some point bow their knee to Jesus and confess and admit he is truly Lord. Because of that, therefore, what I'm about to say links back to what I just said. Because of that, my beloved Paul writes, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Paul's basically saying, don't just do God's work when I'm around. You know what I mean? Do it all the time. And so it's kind of one of those things where if, if the things that we do for God, you only do when the preacher's around, maybe your heart's not in it just right, right? Is Paul saying that you, we, should, we should do God's work all the time, not to just, you know, get a pat on the back or get, um, you know, um, 
accolades, but ultimately, you know, he's to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And this verse has been severely taken out of context uh, over the years. And a lot of people look at that verse, work, <clears throat> excuse me, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And a lot of people look at it and say, oh, well, that means I get to, I get to work out my own deal with God, Right? Work out your own salvation. That means, okay, well, I'll, I'll work out this deal with God, and, and, and I'll, that's not what that means at all, okay? What is he saying? He's putting everything in the right order. Faith first, works second. So what he's saying is, we're saved by Jesus first. He died, and we'll confess him as Lord, and then, and therefore, we work out that salvation with fear and trembling. We work because of the salvation. Doesn't mean I get to uh, strike up my own deal with God. There is but one deal. There is but one way to be saved, and that is to come through Jesus Christ, repent of our sins, believe in him, and live for him the rest of our life. Amen? We don't work out our own deal. That's the only deal. God says, take it or leave it. Okay? It is God who works, and then he goes on to say, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It's God that gives us then the ability to do the work. I mean, think about it. Folks, this is kind of a, we got, the, we got the best part of this deal, right? Because you can't earn anything, can't work or do anything to earn salvation. I'm just going to give that to you. And after you're saved, you know, when we have this appreciation, God says, now I'm going to give you work to do because of your salvation. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and give you the ability to do that. We don't even have to muster our own strength to work for God. God provides everything. That which we need to be saved and that which we need to work for him and live as a Christian each and every day. I wasn't going to say this, la this next part because it kind of convicts me a little bit. Do all things without grumbling. <laughs> I know I could have left that part off. I started to, but then I thought I might be a little hypocritical if I did. There's works that God gives us. He said, I want you to do it, and I want you to do it without, without grumbling because it is a privilege. Again, it's not about, oh, I'll do this because God did it for me. It's the heart of gratitude that God is looking for in our works. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, this, Jesus speaks this on the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you, he's speaking ultimately to us as people, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. What is the purpose of a light? It has a work to do. A light does. And that's to give light, in the, to cast the darkness out so that everybody can see. That's the work of a light. And Jesus said, that's the work that I've given you to do as my church. Let your light shine. In other words, let people see Jesus in you, right? Let see, let, just let people see Jesus in you. Act like Jesus. Talk like Jesus. Tell people about Jesus. And God, he says, then I'll, I'll draw all, all people in. Let people see your good works. Not that they'll glorify you, but that they may glorify your Father, which is in heaven. He's very clear here. Ask yourself this question. Here's a pride check. I think we all need a pride check every once in a while because we're humans and we have a tendency to be proud, and want a lot of recognition. Here's your pride check. If you do something as a work for God, are you okay if nobody, nobody but God ever knows about it? Think about that now because we, I mean, we all like to pat on the back when something, you know, we like for everybody to know when we've done something. But the greatest gift you give to God is when we give something and nobody else knows about it. What we give in secret, God rewards openly, Right? Are you okay with your work if not a soul knows about it? That's the purest of gifts. That God gets the glory and not us. Now in James chapter 2, James writes this. He says, now what, what good is it, my brothers? If, now, now listen very carefully to this. I'm going to explain what this means. Because here's the, well, let me read this and then I'll explain. So James 2 verse 14 says, what good is it, my brothers? If someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one, says, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works, 
Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And so when you first read that, a lot of times people get confused by that because it, it has the appearance at first that it's saying, well, no, you have to, there has to be works involved in order to be saved. He says, can, can faith alone basically save you? What good is faith if it doesn't have any works? And so what you got to understand in this scripture, when he says, can faith Basically, faith by itself save you. And there's got to be some works. He's not talking about the salvation of our soul here. He's not talking about Jesus saving us from our soul. He's talking about us saving other people in the need that they have. Here's the example he gives. If somebody that you know, you come across somebody and they're destitute of food, they don't have food, they're starving to death, and you have the ability to help them, but you say to them instead, I will pray for you, Right? I have faith that everything's going to work out for you. Did that faith save them? Did it help them? Here's another example. Let's say you're walking along by a swimming pool, and there's somebody out in the middle of it, and they're drowning. They can't swim. And they're like, help me, help me, help me. And you say, I have faith that God will help you. Good luck to you. And you walk on. Did your faith save that person? No. I have to jump in and pull them out. It's my works that save them. He's not talking about saving our, if we work, we earn salvation. He's talking about the fact, again, it all comes back down to the people. It's our, our faith first, and then our works. That's, what's, that's what accomplishes things for the kingdom of God. I've got to jump in and help that person if, I'm, if my works are going to be what saves them. So Paul goes on to say, you know, you can say, I have faith. And he said, show that, prove that to me. Without works. It's, not, it's impossible. You, he, basically Paul said, I dare you to, to prove to me that you honestly have faith without any works. You can't do that because words don't prove anything. You can say anything, right? So Paul says, what I'll do, I will show you or I will prove my faith by my works. Words are very cheap. Isn't that true? I can say I have faith. That proves nothing. It's the works that I do that proves I truly have faith. Saying I love Jesus, but acting like the devil doesn't prove anything, right? So the idea is that God wants us to say I love Jesus with our faith and then act like Jesus with our works because that's the part that everybody sees. Imagine giving somebody, imagine giving somebody that you love a gift. You have the goodness of your heart and love and you want to show this love and you hand them a gift and they just snatch it out of your hands without so much as a thank you. They show no appreciation whatsoever. They don't appreciate the fact that you sacrificed for that, you worked for it, the money that went involved. They just snatch it out and they walk off with no appreciation. How would that, how would that make you feel? And they might appreciate it, but you would know it based on their actions. Doesn't make you want to, kind of takes the fun out of gift giving, doesn't it? It does. It's the same for a Christian who does not basically show their faith by their works. It's, a, it's an entitled type. We hear a lot about, we hear that word a lot these days, entitlement. You know, people have this entitlement. They don't want to work for what they have. Uh, they just feel like everything ought to be given to them, you know, so on and so forth. We have this entitlement mentality, and that doesn't work in the area of salvation. In other words, God gives me a great gift of salvation. I know I'm not entitled to that. Does that make sense? To just take this great gift and then go about my way and really not give Jesus the praise that he deserves, the thanks that he deserves for the work that he did for me at the Calvary is very, would be very selfish indeed. That's what, folks, and I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here. Obviously, you're here this morning because of this very reason Jesus saved you. And we're, that's what we, that was what worship was all about this morning. Is we're worship, we can worship God because we recognize we are not entitled to salvation in any way, shape, or form. Entitlement is a paycheck, right? If I, if I work for you all week long, then I'm entitled to a paycheck. But I'm not entitled to a gift. It's different. A gift is something that's given freely and openly and from God's heart. And in response, we praise him for it. Paul, in his letter to the, to the Galatians, this is, like the, this is like the opposite side of the spectrum. He's dealing with some people who hadn't quite figured this all out yet. In Galatians chapter 3, Paul writes this. That, well, first of all, let me say this, a little background before I read this. If you read a lot of the letters of Paul, he's, reading to, he's writing to say, hey, you guys are doing a good job. I want to encourage you. Make sure. But the letter to the Galatian church is very, 
is very obvious the Galatians church did, they weren't doing a good job, right? They had completely gotten off track. And here's why. There were people basically who came into the church at Galatia and were teaching everybody that not only do you have to believe in Jesus to be saved, but you also have to be circumcised, right? You also have to follow the rules of the law in order to be saved. So in other words, we're saved by Jesus and works. And so Paul, in response to that, he finds out about that, which is complete, uh, f- completely false. And so in response to that, he writes to them and he, he calls them foolish. He said, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who tricked you? It, it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly betrayed as crucified. Let me ask you this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? In other words, when, when I came into Galatia and I preached the gospel and the Holy Spirit dealt with your heart and you believed in Jesus and you repented and you were saved, remember that experience. Did you get that experience because you did something? No, you did it because of pure faith. You heard the gospel, God gave you a free gift, and you received it. So he goes on, are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now perfected by the flesh, or the things that you can do, basically? In Galatians 2, he says this, we ourselves are are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works. To be justified means to be accepted by God. We're not accepted by God because of the things we do, but by grace, uh, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And then in verse, chapter one, verse eight, he says this, I'm astonished or I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you into the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel. Look here. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one that we preach to you, let him be accursed. In other words, he said, I, basically what Paul's, and all that Paul's saying, guys, I'm just shocked that after what God did in you, this great gift that God gave you, and somebody comes along and you are deceived into believing that suddenly now it's by your works that you can be saved. You've been tricked. He said, in other words, he said, that is not the real gospel. That's another gospel. There's a lot of church folks, let me, and I'm not gonna go too much into the weeds because if you, if you sling mud, you lose ground, right? But there are a lot of churches and denominations today in this day and age that put an awful lot of, church rules and unbiblical traditions that, they, that basically are inclusions into salvation. If you want to be saved, you have to join our church. You have to be baptized this way, dress this way, say this. You have to do this, this. And it's all about this big long list of man-made rules that you have to do in order to be saved. And Paul is saying here, that's a different gospel. It's wrong. The only true gospel. He, in fact, Paul takes it a step further. He said, look, if somebody, if another person comes to you preaching something different than what I told you, which was that salvation is a free gift and you can't earn it. If somebody comes telling you something different, they are cursed by God. If an angel from heaven comes to you and tells you something different, let him be accursed. He said, buddy, what he's saying is this. God has put it in stone. When Jesus died on the cross and said, it is finished, and that all who come to him might be saved, it was written in stone that nobody can ever do anything to earn God's love. It is a free gift. It's not about churchy things and churchy ways. That's why we try so hard in this church to keep it very simple. Amen? It is not hard to be saved. All it takes is us receiving the gift. Resist the temptation. Well, I've got to do this. A lot of people say this. They say like, well, I I know I need to give my heart to God, but, you know, before I do that, I need to get this area of my life fixed first. That's a work. You know, I've got this area, you know, I've just not surrendered. I got this sin that I'm dealing with. As soon as I get that figured out and get it worked out and get over it, then I'll give my heart to God. And God's saying, no, that's what you're trying to do is you're trying to earn your way into my love. That's not how it works. We come to Jesus just exactly how we are, messed up. We come to him with our problems, and then he gives us the strength to overcome those things. Do you get it? It's easy. It's simple. It's a gift. All you got to do is receive it. Why do we overcomplicate it so much? In Matthew, I'm going to bring us in for a landing here. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says this. Not everyone who says to me, to, to says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter 
the kingdom of heaven. Remember we said a minute ago, words are cheap. It's easy to say things. Not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out in your name uh, demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, worker of iniquity. What is he saying here? Not everybody that says, Lord, Lord. Not, not everybody that professes to be a Christian, because again, words are, are cheap. It's about whether or not we've really accepted the Lord in our heart. But he said, on that day, there'll be a lot of people that says, Lord, but we did a lot of works for you, right? We did this, Lord. We did that. We went to church. We paid our tithes. We prayed for people. We did all of these works. Surely that's enough to get us into heaven. And Jesus says, it's not. Because you're trusting in those works to get you into heaven. I don't know you. Think about that. Isn't that a shame? People that would, can give their whole life to working for God and then miss the mark because they never really knew God. They were trusting in what they did to get saved. We don't go to church, for example. She's that as an example. We don't come here on Sunday morning so that we can get our check mark and that when we get to heaven, God will say, okay, I'll let you in because you did good about going to church. That ain't what it's about. It don't work that way. I can go to church every Sunday, every time the doors are open and still miss the mark. No, 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 no. We go to church because we got saved and we love the Lord and we want to come worship him, right? This is a work that takes place in appreciation for the work that Jesus did for us at Calvary. One of the best, I'm going to end with this. One of the best examples that I can, that I can think about in scripture <clears throat> to illustrate this was one day Jesus was, was invited to a dinner it was by a, by a Pharisee, a big religious person. And they laid out the spread, lots of food. This guy provided food and the whole bit for Jesus and the meal. And while this meal is going on, there's a lady that comes into the room. First of all, that wasn't allowed too much, you know, back in those days. It was a gathering of men. men ladies wouldn't allow. But if a lady was allowed, it wouldn't be a lady like this. Bible says she was a sinner. In other words, she just had a reputation for being a sinful woman. Every, anybody would look at her would automatically look at her past and the things that she's done. She's, you know, not worth, not worthy to be in here amongst all the church people. You know, that's kind of that was the idea. That was the mentality. But this woman, recognizing her sinful condition, she she comes to Jesus. The Bible says that she got down on her knees, and she was just kissing the feet of Jesus. She was weeping. In the presence, she recognized she was in the presence of God. That's who Jesus was. She recognized what Jesus had done for her, what he had, that he had showed her kindness, that he had showed her love. And in this, in this act of appreciation, she's weeping and she's crying and her, tears are falling on Jesus' feet and she takes her hair, the utmost form of servanthood. You can't get any lower than that. And she takes her hair and she begins to wash Jesus' feet with her tears by her hair. And the Bible says that she had brought a very expensive um, bottle of ointment. Very expensive. Maybe something that she had saved her whole life. She brings this in, the very best that she has, and she begins to, she breaks that jar and begins to anoint the feet of Jesus with this ointment, with this perfume. Of course, all the people are looking at her and they're like, oh, he can't really be from God or he'd never let a woman like this touch his feet. And Jesus scolds them and he says this. I love this. This is chapter 7, verse 47. He said, therefore, I tell, he scolds the guy. He said, number one, I came to your house. You didn't wash my feet. That was custom of the day. Anybody that come to your house for a meal, you, you would have their servants wash their feet. They, he didn't, this guy, this ritzy guy didn't do that for Jesus. Didn't feel like he was worth it, I guess. He said, you didn't wash my feet. You didn't give me any kind of, you know, hospitality really. But this woman, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven for she loved much. So he basically says to these guys, he said, look, if somebody's been forgiven for a lot of sin or somebody's been forgiven for a little sin, who's probably going to appreciate it the most? They said, well, probably the one who's been forgiven for a lot of sin. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, she was a sinful woman. 
I mean, their opinion of her, I guess, was right. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. <laughs> My point in all of that is this. Is this woman is washing Jesus' feet with her tears, with her hair, giving him everything, this ointment. It was not so that he would forgive her. She wasn't doing this work, trying to get him to show her love. She did this out of response to his love. Does that make sense? Because he loved her, because he forgave her, because he delivered her, she performed this great act of gratitude for him. And these holy guys just couldn't wrap their brain around that. Surely you got to do something to earn salvation. Nope. Free gift available to anybody and everybody despite what we've done in our past. God forgives us. Are you, are you glad for this? Do you recognize this morning that you couldn't possibly muster enough to do enough to get saved? To, to do something to earn God's forgiveness and love? You can't. Free gift. When is a gift not a gift? When you have to work for it. The gospel states that we don't have to work for it. God made it available to us through Jesus. Ladies, if you come to the piano. That anybody, whosoever believes in him, should not perish but have everlasting life. Everybody knows John 3, 16. If our salvation was based on works, it'd say something like, for God so loved the world that whosoever does dot, 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 whoever goes to church every Sunday, pays their tithes, gives their, you know, helps people along the way, whoever does this will have eternal life. That's not what it said. God loved the world so much that whoever believes in Jesus shall not perish, but have everlasting life receiving the gift. So I wonder this morning, if there's anybody in this place today that needs to be saved. God has given his gift to you 2,000 years ago when his son died on the cross. The gift is available. And you and I, all you have to do this morning is accept it. Lord, I receive this gift. Would you bow with me this morning? This is as simple as saying this. Lord, I receive the gift that you are offering me today. I open my hands, I open my heart and my mind and I invite you to come in. I know that I have nothing to offer you. I know that I couldn't do enough to earn your love, but I realize and I accept today that you're giving it to me free of charge. And I trust the work that you did on the cross as a work for me personally. You loved me first, and now I, in turn, love you back. That right there, folks, is salvation. If you can pray that this morning with an honest prayer, God saved you. Believe that. Accept that. Don't worry about the works part. That'll come. That comes automatically. Just because you love him. He'll take care of that. He'll show you what to do later. All you got to worry about right now is getting right with God. So that when you die or when Jesus returns, whichever comes first, both are inevitable. Both will happen. We all know we're going to die someday. And we know that Jesus will return. This is all about preparation for that day. That's why Jesus died. So when that moment happens, when that trumpet sounds, the Bible says we can stand before God with confidence. Not confidence in ourselves and what we did, but confidence that Jesus is with us. Hallelujah. Do you need to be saved this morning? Let God do a work in your heart today. As they sing this morning, maybe God's dealing with your heart today. These altars are open by all means. We invite you to come today. If, you, if God's dealing with your heart and you want to be saved, we will pray with you. But at the very least, let God do the work in you today. Right where you sit. Maybe you can just say, maybe just lift your hand and say, I, I know I need to be saved. I won't embarrass anybody, I promise. The Bible says we confess with our mouth and we believe in our heart. It comes a point where we have to be able to declare to the world, hey, I, I just got a gift from God. So it's like even, even that, even, even saying and acknowledging, raising your hand, I, I give my heart to the Lord, I want to be saved today. It's not so much that you have to do that to be saved. It's just a matter of saying, hey, I just got a gift from God and I want everybody to know about it. God just saved me. And I'm so excited to be a part of his kingdom. Hallelujah. So simple. 
So simple.